Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Hunting a June Bug, written by underscore underscore te underscore underscore. June Brook Kokarin, June Bug, to her friends, ate her unsweetened oats in a determined silence. Each bite a bitter battle, each sludgy, salty swallow a pyric victory. She finished and glared at the ball, emptied of the enemy, and knew the warden would simply refill it tomorrow. It was a little overdramatic, the oatmeal wasn't awful, but the two-decade sentence for hacking a few bank accounts to be a money mule was, uh... Christina Sverkchenskaya did the same thing. Junebug had followed the news closely and got a slap on the wrist, but the judge didn't feel Junebug regretted her actions. Well, she didn't, but who did? She was being punished for being authentic. Or maybe the judge just thought that Christina was a lot sexier, or but here. Ignoring the pointlessness and the other inmates, she stood and carried her spoon and bowl to the returns bin, dropped them in, and marched back to her cell. Half an hour later, mystified guards found her empty cell and started up the alarms. Between one step and the next, Junebug plunged hip deep into the dark, muddy, very warm water. She felt a bee sting on her neck and a sudden dizziness caused her to fall and rest the way into the water. She panicked, swallowed water, and thrashed around, finding a tree branch and hauling herself up out of the water. After a few moments to gather her wits, she took a few more deep breaths and took stock. The air was thick and humid and hot. She was lightheaded. The side of her neck was sore and warm to the touch. The air smelled like salt water and rotting flowers. The tree was not anything she recognized. It had a sturdy branching pattern, but the leaves looked like hanging lace ribbons, and the skin had a rubbery texture she instantly loathed. She realized that she was seeing her first alien fauna. It looked like a fat, successful rat-squirrel hybrid, with no fur and dark walnut brown skin. Its eyes, all four of them, were arranged concentrically around a worm-like mouth. Junebug started to shake and gripped the tree limb tighter. A virtual screen, fuzzy at first, came into focus in a field of vision. It had a message. Welcome, human. You have ten days to survive on the alien planet, after which you will be returned to your home. Unfortunately, you will have memory problems, so the screen will remain visible to you at all times. Check it often. Sometimes it'll have new info. We will give you two days to acclimate and learn the local area. The leaves, grasses, and local fodder should all be edible to you. Most of the things that look like berries are at least mildly toxic. If you see small white spheres on a bluish plant, those are very edible and provide good nutrition. We strongly recommend finding those if you can. After two days, we will hunt, kill, and eat you unless you manage to escape. Do your best, and uh, good luck. Junebug's vision narrowed down to a tunnel at the end of which was a message. Her heart pounded in her head, and breathing became difficult. She closed her eyes and gripped the tree. When panic attack passed, she took a great big gulping breaths, leaning against the tree, and opened her eyes. Nothing had changed. She was still angry, and she couldn't continue to sit on the tree branch until the alien showed up and killed her. She lowered herself back into the water and stopped. Lowering herself was too easy, Experimentally, she did a chin-up, then a one-armed chin-up. Holy crap! It was a low-gravity planet, apparently, or at least low-ish. She dropped back into the water, picked the closest-looking hill, and set off, keeping an eye out for tiny white spheres. Halfway there, she had to cling to the tree while she vomited. She'd swallowed too much raw water, and she half expected this horrible, wretched nausea, but it still wasn't fair. She continued on towards the hill. The Poe kidnapped humans reasonably often. It wasn't necessary, strictly speaking, but it was fun. And although humans outmassed Poe almost two to one, came from a somewhat higher gravity world, and were comparatively terrifying beasts, the Poe had a great deal of technology on their side. They didn't use all of it, of course. It took too much fun out of the hunt, but two technologies in particular were vital. 
the wormhole, a massive expenditure of energy close to the total output of the sun for a trillionth of a second, dropped a human into one of the Poe's favorite hunting grounds. It was expensive. The four rich Poe nobles who hunted, it was the best and least traceable way to acquire game. The wormhole was also accurate down to the micrometer and microsecond, which let the Poe set up the second technology to hit the target as they arrived. Microscopic darts loaded with mild opioid analgesic location trackers only used if the target survived so they could be found and returned home. Sensory editing and recording devices, additional opioid time-release capsules, and other needed bits and pieces. The drugs were chosen for their ability to interfere with long-term memory formation. The Poe were always careful to leave no memories of the events. And it was better to prevent than wipe. It was an extra special bonus. It made the hunt easier when the victims couldn't remember more than an hour of their past. The Poe had hunted humans from all over Earth, rednecks to monks, prostitutes to mercenaries, soldiers of every stripe and nationality, bank tellers, and more. In comparison to some of the missing persons list who had walked these hills, Junebug was perhaps a hair above average, mostly on account of three weeks spent in a primitive skills retreat. She knew how to nap flint, build a fire, and manage the most basic and simple of survival in the wild. But she'd never fought for her life, never done anything sneakier than a Saturday night window slide, never dealt with the terror of being hunted. But the Poe had never hunted a human who wasn't doped to the gills. And one small, tiny respect, Junebug was special. While she got her looks from the Brazilian Kafuza mother, she got her Scandinavian Irish dad's absurd height, and his near-complete immunity to the kindness of dentists. Thanks to the not uncommon genetic disorder that rendered him highly resistant to opioids. Jubebug spent the first hour or so getting out of the water. The aliens dropped her in the middle of a shallow lake surrounded by low hills. The water was filled with unrecognizable aquatic plants, many of which grew to a height few feet above the water and trees every few minutes. Climbing the trees helped with navigation, but she still had to hike and swim through the water. Most of it was hip deep, but some of it was shoulder deep or deeper. She tried not to think about what might be lurking between the grassy fronds, particularly when she had to swim across the deep gap. Once on dry ground, she'd take off her clothes and hung them to dry, and did her best to squidge the salt water out of her hair. Then she chewed on lace leaves. They tasted like sour lettuce and surveyed the land. The local mammal equivalent was furless and fast. The fat turned out to be flaps of skin in the low gravity. Most animals she saw seemed to have developed at least minimal gliding ability. Without a weapon, she wouldn't be eating meat. The lace leaves were filling and terrible. There was no goddamn white spheres on bluish plants. And the water was salty. She needed to purify it if she didn't want to die. For that matter, she needed a fire for lots of reasons. While her orange jumpsuit died, Junebug gathered her driest moss that she could find and hunted bits of fallen twigs and sticks and made a pile. She picked up the straightest stick, scooped out a hollow in the fattest stick, and began spinning. Success happened surprisingly easy. She piled on some of the bits of dry moss and some twigs, and then fell back as the fire jumped to the moss she stood on, which caught fire instantly and began to blaze up. Holy crap! Junebug backed away and watched in horror as the moss fire spread and spread. As she retreated, it continued to burn, and finally she ran to the water and watched as the hillside burned. Then the tips of the water fonds caught and a blaze began to spread across the lake. Cussing, she dove under and towards open water, then watched with a kind of horrified fascination as the fire flashed across the lake. She stayed in the water for half an hour before the hillside burnt out and then crawled back into the land. The half-melted remains of her polyester underwear and jumpsuit were dry. Her cotton socks were ash. Her shoes were wearable, at least. She tried the remains of the jumpsuit around herself as a kind of half-toga and then sat on the ground and cried. Nothing about this was even remotely fair, and she still needed a fire. This time, 
She took a stout branch and dug a patch of moss down on the bare dirt. She regathered supplies, fewer and mostly burnt this time, and practiced her stick spinning. It was surprisingly easy again, but at least this time it didn't immediately jump to the moss. Soon, she had a fire, hotter than expected, and burning fast. She piled more sticks on, and they caught fire almost immediately. She stared at the fire and realized anything here was burning easily. The plants had a high oxygen content. She was probably a bit high herself. The aliens were going to be lucky if she lived long enough for them to hunt. But at least starting a fire wasn't going to be a problem. While that burned, she went to the lake and pulled up some grass from below the surface. When she had great fistfuls of the stuff, she began doing a very simple over-under weave. When she had a reasonable sheet, she took two sticks and made a tent over the fire, scooped up some clay and made two crude bowls, put water in the bowl, put one bowl in the fire and one at the edge of the tent lip. Feeding the fire steamed the water and the condensation ran down into the second bowl. While the water accumulated, Junebug ripped up burnt leaves and made a meal. They tasted significantly better burnt, Caramelization appeared to be the spice of choice here. The temperature in the evening steadied somewhere between 80 Fahrenheit. She could live without the fire overnight, which is a goddamn miracle. She set aside the bowls and dumped salt water on the fire, found a niche she could put it back into, and fell asleep. In the morning, the message was mostly the same, but it said that she had nine days, and it didn't even mention that she'd already been there for a day. She noticed some other dishonesties as well. There was now a recommendation to find the white spheres in the middle of the lake. Trolling was into Shiva, apparently. She idly noticed the moss, lake plants, and everything else had regrown overnight. It was as green as the day before. She'd wondered if they'd actually planned to kill her, or whether that was just more trolling. Best to treat it as real, in which case today was her last free day. Home Hill was not a particularly rocky, but she saw a nearby hill with a good-sized crevice and made her way to it. When she found Flint, she renamed this to Home and set to making an edge. She learned a second lesson about fire in high oxygen environments and dove into the water to put out her toga. Now, well and truly pissed off, she acquired a stout branch, water grasses, and a semi-broken stone. She lashed together a primitive axe. Then she hunted furless rat squirrel meat by throwing rocks, chopped more branches down with her axe, built a fire, and sat down for lunch. The rat squirrel was fecking delicious, particularly with caramelized lace leaf. The grass-flavored condensation dip was not unlike lemon tea. As she bit into a tender, lightly charred meat, Junebug realized what tasted best. This was a freedom meal. She might die tomorrow, but today she was free. And the fires had given her a terrible idea for the alien hunters. As evening fell, Junebug continued to hike. She had a handful of rocks in a grass pouch and baked clay bowl of water, a dull and terrible axe, a grass toga, and a gall. The thicker woods ahead. Once there, she found a freshwater stream and threw caution to the wind and drank deep before refilling her bowl. She was probably going to die anyway. No reason to die thirsty. The forest had a few properties she wanted. It was thick and would make hiding easier. And it was flammable, with a water pool she could jump into when she set off the oxygen trap for her hunters. A little after nightfall, she wedged enough brush into the fork of branches to hold herself, crawling up into the nest, and fell asleep. She wasn't sure how things would go tomorrow, but she hoped, sweet mercy, that she really wanted to give her hunters a proper fight. Flip Top was on the ground before door, and three mighty hunters, he was the most eager. This was his eleventh sapient hunt and first human. The planet was a little oxygen deficient, so he had an oxygen pump augmented in the air immediately around him, plus active camouflage and armor. The light rifle rated for earth carnivores, tracking gear, and his wits. He didn't really expect to see the human this early, but he kept the rifle at the ready, just in case. The Poe resembled the greys of urban myth, although they had almost never set foot on earth. Tall and thin, with large heads, non-existent chins, 
large black eyes, and virtually no other visible facial features. Humanoid and endoskeleton, but with hollow bones and a lamprey-like venomous mouth, gonyotoxin. The bow breathed via brachial tubing throughout their body like an insect, and they were heterothermic predators from warm tropical oceans. Although similar looking to humans, they had relatively poor smell and taste outside of salt water, terrible hearing, and excellent, almost bird-like vision. They could see near infrared, one reason humans were amusing prey for them. Flip-top was a practical hunter. His eyes clearly marked out the swath of bent fronds and torn leaves of the human's route to shore. Knowing this biome had no megafauna, and certainly nothing dangerous to the Poe, he swam easily and swiftly to the shoreline and stalked the path. Neither Pliptop nor Junebug knew the flora grew fast in response to fire, so he was puzzled when he could not find evidence of her camping. Still, he could see her path through the water as to her second campsite and made his way there. By then, the sun had risen and his two companions, both similarly experienced hunters, joined him. The rocky campsite gave more details. She collected rocks, caught and cooked some local wildlife, dripped the water all over, then made her way towards sunrise. They congratulated themselves on their quarry. If it could catch local wildlife drugged to the girls, it was going to be an excellent hunt. Flip-top updated the quarry message to emphasize a carnivorous diet. They consulted their maps, higher ground, forests, streams, a good place for a forest primitive. No one was surprised it knew what it was doing, but Plumptop did wonder out loud some curiosity about whether they had accidentally gotten a real primitive, one for whom high ground was more instinctive. They followed the trail as the sun began to set. They had still not reached the forest or caught up to the prey. After some discussion, they retreated to their ship and decided to drop down near the forest in the morning. Junebug smeared herself in mud and spent most of the day laying false trails near her pool of water, never straying too far from safety, or from the forest fire starter pit that she'd prepared. The forest had bat monkey flies, and she caught a couple with thrown rocks. They were as tasty as the rat squirrel, even uncooked. Her fire starter trap she was proud of. It looked like a branch fall, or as close as she could make it, but it had a highly flammable moss underneath and a large flint rock. She could throw a flint at it, and probably light it. If not, she would have to risk sprinting to it and back, but hopefully it would work. When the aliens didn't show by nightfall, she amused herself for a while by examining the virtual translucent message screen. It disappeared when she closed her eyes, then faded back into vision when she opened them. Experimentally, she closed one eye and squinted the other eye into an almost blink. The screen flickered. She tried the other eye. It flickered again, and she caught a glimpse of uh, alien text. She tried again, and again. She could just make out a second screen before the first one. She tried everything, squinting, zigzagging eyes, reaching her hand through the screen, blinking. Finally, she blinked three times at the right rate, and the message screen was suddenly following her gaze. She gazed left, and the alien text was left behind. She blinked three times again, letting go of the first one, and looked at the alien one. It had buttons. Leaving them alone for the night, she hid by the pool and slept fitfully. Near dawn, the faint shuffle of large feet woke her, and she slipped into the mud near the pool. Pliptop set a craft down near the trees and marveled at the distance the human covered. Not unexpected, not really, but they had a real specimen on hand. His companions agreed this would be an epic hunt. They checked the nearby woods for the human, then dropped down by the trail and began tracking again. Active camouflage would make them near invisible as long as they were careful, but they moved only one at a time, two watching and one making short crawls. Soon enough, they found the crisscrossing trails everywhere. The human was repeating itself now that the easy external goal of the forest was done. The plan was simple, find its camp, wound it a little to scare it into running, and then hunt it down, wounding it a little more each time until it bled out. Finally, they found its camp. No sizable thermal signature, but plenty of evidence. It ate here a few times, fashioned a small tent. Pup-Pup realized the problem. It had crisscrossed its own trails enough. 
They couldn't tell which way it was last left. They would need to hide near the camp and wait for its next return. He was just turning to tell his companions his revelation when a rock rocketed past his face, barely curving in the planet's gravity, and struck another rock buried amongst some branch fall. The Poe do not panic. They have no mechanism for adrenaline in the human sense, and while they can feel a form of danger avoidance similar to fear, it never results in a visceral fight or flight or freeze response of the Terran fauna. This and the heterotrophic nature means that they tend to act at the same speed regardless of the situation. But Pliptop managed for his species a credible moment of pants crapping terror as he put two and two together. He saw flames licking angrily outwards from the branches. He did not bother to warn his companions. He merely began a slow, plodding pole run towards his only safety he saw, a nearby pool of water, and disconnected and dropped his oxygen chunks on the ground. The first of his companions saw the fire almost in the same instant as death arrived. The fire hit the oxygen-saturated cloud around the Poe and the delicate fibers of his camouflage and exploded into a whirling conflagration of oxygen tank, Poe flesh, and textiles. The second companion was not given even that much warning. The explosions from the first caught him facing the other direction, keeping an eye out for the human. It also caught Plip Top, knocking him closer to the water. Unfortunately, away from the tanks he dropped on the ground behind him. The Poe could not labor for breath. Their brachial tubing simply worked or it did not. But he could feel deprivation setting in. And he knew the water was fresh water, which would not breathe well. But he had no choice. He could at least cling to life. The human rose out of the mud next to him, a primitive stone axe in hand. Flip Top wondered briefly how the human had managed to put this whole plan together without long-term memory. And then, he died. Junebug dragged the corpse into the water with her, and the fire raged and exploded all around. She wanted a gun, even though she didn't know how to operate it, and she wanted the keys to their ship, if things worked that way. It took a few days, but she managed to work out some basic actions in the alien menu, and the gun was surprisingly well-designed and easy to use. She ate well for those few days. Finally, she found the ship, and, with Plip Top's corpse accompanying her, was able to get the doors to open. With a little experimentation, she discovered she only needed his head, and soon she found a bed of reasonable size and accommodation. Given how user-friendly their interfaces were, she was reasonably certain that she could figure out a way off-planet. Maybe she could be a privateer, or maybe she could find a way home and parlay with the alien spaceship into personal freedom. It didn't matter too much. Those were problems for tomorrow. For now, she wanted a proper night's sleep. The bed was soft and inviting and warm. She had never slept in a better bed, Jumbuck decided. End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and patrons. Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Barky, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Lord Azrakul and Arcadian. 